the aspect of pathogen evolution that probably has the most serious consequences for clinical medicine is the evolution of antibiotic resistance. Pathogens very rapidly evolve resistance to antibiotics. Resistant infections are killing thousands of people every year. Modern surgery depends on having effective antibiotics so that people can recover from surgery. The drug pipeline is drying up, so it's serious. This is a major issue. So first, resistance evolves very rapidly. Here are the timelines uh, of introducing various antibiotics, the year introduced, the year that resistance was observed. Penicillin, introduced in 1943, resistance observed in 1945. Chloramphenicol, in introduced in 1949, resistance observed in 1950. Erythromycin, introduced in 1952, resistance observed in 1956. You can read down the rest. The point is that resistance evolves rapidly every time a new antibiotic is introduced. Now to put things in perspective, this is the mortality rate per 100,000 people per year in the United States, starting in 1900 and going through to about 1990. There's a big spike here from the 1918 influenza epidemic. And you can see that mortality was actually dropping quite a bit before penicillin was introduced in 1943. So if we lost our ability to treat infectious disease with antibiotics, mortality levels might rise back up to about here, but they would not go back to here. So it is serious, but it won't take us back to the 19th century. It will take us back to the 1940s. Now, what are antibiotics? They are actually quite a heterogeneous class of molecules that interfere with the growth and reproduction of bacteria. Many of them occur naturally, many of them are in the soil, and they are isolated from bacteria and fungi, which evolved them for purposes of coevolutionary interaction and competition, mostly in the soil. Naturally occurring antibiotics are then often modified to make them more effective. Some of them are synthetic and they may have no natural counterpart. So how do they work and what is their objective? They work by mimicking a critical molecule or by blocking an active site by binding to it irreversibly and competing with a naturally occurring molecule for binding, passage, or, pet or transport. Their objective is to kill or to slow the growth of the target organism and to do so with minimal toxicity to the patient. So antibiotics are designed to target a unique feature of the pathogen that is not shared by the host. This is much easier to do if the pathogen is a prokaryote than if it's a eukaryote. It's hard to do this for helminths and that is why anti-helminthic drugs are often toxic to humans. It's because worm cells are fairly similar to human cells. Now, bacteria can acquire resistance genes through any of three mechanisms of horizontal transfer. They can also acquire resistance by mutating, but more often they acquire resistance by getting the genes from a huge library of genetic information that's already out there. One of the ways of doing it is through transformation. So they take up free DNA. Here, ABR is standing for antibiotic resistance determinant. And they can in incorporate it into their circular chromosome. So they can actually eat DNA in the environment. Often they would just use it as a, as a nutrient, but sometimes they can incorporate it into their circular chromosome. The second way that they can get information is by transduction. That's done when a virus that attacks bacteria, a bacteriophage, picks up some of the bacterial DNA, incorporates it into its own DNA, brings that antibiotic resistance determinant along with it, and inserts it by transposition into the bacterial chromosome. So 
It's using all of the genetic machinery that it has evolved to transport its own genetic information and it uses it to bring along some of the bacterial information with it. The third way is through conjugation. So in this case, the antibiotic resistant determinant is encoded in a plasmid, which is a little piece of circular DNA, which is in the bacterial cell. And the plasmid induces conjugation so that, so that it can be horizontally transferred. So plasmids contain other genes besides the antibiotic resistance determinants that tell the bacteria to turn on the bacterial equivalent of sex, which is conjugation, and to transmit the plasmid horizontally into another bacterium. There, there can be transposition and recombination, and the antibiotic resistance determinant can move from the plasmid into the bacterial circular chromosome. So there are actually three fairly well-developed mechanisms by which bacteria can move information on antibiotic resistance horizontally. This horizontal transfer has produced things that look like this multi-drug resistance complex in Salmonella typhimurium. So here there, you can see there is an integrase, which is part of the transposon facility. That's how the uh, whole complex gets integrated into the circular chromosome. That's a recombination site and a common promoter. And then in the complex, we have substrates for a number of different antibiotic resistance determinants. We, there is a, a marvelous thing called quack E delta, which actually is a general membrane pump that pumps toxins out of the bacterial cell. It will even pump soap out of the bacterial cell. And here is a gene that provides resistance to sulfonamides. So this entire battery of genetic information can be moved on a plasmid and incorporated in a new bacterium. Now, one of the really important ideas coming from evolutionary biology into the study of antibiotic resistance is on this slide. Bacterial genetics have important implications for therapy. The critical issue is this. Do the genes for drug resistance exist in the pathogen population prior to the infection, or do they originate through mutation after infection begins? And here's why it's important. If the former, that is, if the genes for drug resistance are there at the beginning of the infection, then strong prolonged antibiotic treatment rapidly selects for resistance. If the latter, in other words, if they're not there at the beginning and they're going to evolve through mutation, then treatment reduces the size of the pathogen population and the probability that a resistant mutation will occur. So it's really critical to, to know whether or not the genes for resistance are there in the bacterial population at the start or whether they evolve by mutation later. Traditional therapies assume that resistance arises through mutation. They are wrong. They are at least often wrong. That assumption is the basis for recommending that patients finish their prescriptions. However, evidence suggests that most infections already contain pathogens with resistant genes. And in that case, we could slow the evolution of resistance by only using enough antibiotic to control the infection rather than by trying to eliminate it. By trying to eliminate it, we are essentially taking out the susceptible clones and we are leaving the resistance strains to multiply. We're clearing out the competition and making it actually a more comfortable environment for the resistant strains to exist in. So by letting the immune system then finish the job, we could slow or avoid the evolution of resistance. So the idea is just to keep the infection under control long enough to allow the immune system to knock it out. Much antibiotic use is unnecessary, inappropriate, or questionable, and that's why antibiotic resistance evolves so quickly. There are unnecessary prescriptions. All antibiotic prescriptions for the common cold are unnecessary. They do no good. 
80% of prescriptions for bronchitis are unnecessary. 50% of prescriptions for sore throat are unnecessary. And 50% of prescriptions for sinusitis are unnecessary. So antibiotics don't work for viral infections and they are often misprescribed. That's also the case for 30% of ear infections. Then there's questionable use. 50% of antibiotics are used in agriculture. That's 25 million pounds of antibiotics each year used in agriculture. 80% of it is either prophylactic or growth promoting. And all of that enhances resistance evolution. There's simply an awful lot of antibiotic out there in the environment causing the evolution of resistance that doesn't need to be there. So, to avoid or delay the evolution of resistance, what can we do? We can reduce the infection rate by avoiding undercooked eggs and meat by washing our hands to slow disease spread. Those are fairly straightforward and actually most hospitals now have very good protocols in place for hand washing. We can limit the use of antibacterial soaps and cleaners. They are not usually necessary, and they simply provide another opportunity for selection to act to select resistance. We can avoid prescribing antibiotics for viral infections. That actually will require both physicians and patients to realize that antibiotics don't do any good if the infection is a virus. We can eliminate antibiotic use in animal feed and all of these approaches are only partially effective. They don't really solve the problem completely. So to summarize, microbial pathogens rapidly evolve resistance, especially in emergency rooms and intensive care units where they are used frequently. Nosocomial infections of multiply resistant pathogens kill more patients each year than breast cancer and HIV combined. Those are infections where people went into the hospital, they acquired the infection in the hospital, and they were killed by it. The genes for resistance often evolved long ago and far away from any interaction with human beings. They have been recovered from the bones of mammoths. They have been recovered thousands of miles from any medical center in wild animals. Every new drug becomes ineffective within a few years and the drug pipeline is drying up. Resistance strains have become increasingly prevalent due to unnecessary, inappropriate, and questionable use of antibiotics in both medicine and in agriculture.